44. And then in uh, your workbooks, I want you pretty much uh, in unit two questions. Unit two's questions. Okay. Yeah, we, we went through unit one. Do we go to unit two? Oh, well, do, do we do just all in unit one? Because we did things in what? So, yeah, we need to do. So, we're going to go page 32. I'm going to start diving in. But before we do, we don't want to do that, which is customary. We're going to pray and then we're going to knock this out. Knock the questions out. Got a lot of people in BTCs uh, right now, so let's just keep them in prayer. There's a lot going on around the world, trust me. And it's getting worse. Worse. They're looking at pushing folks yeah. like that. So let's keep everybody in prayer. Yeah. We're going to go ahead and pray the uh, Lord's Prayer like we always do before we start. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to pick up in Unit 2. We're going to go through the questions first. But if you do have questions, feel free to stop us. Hopefully we don't get stuck in, uh, in traffic with those questions. But we're going to reiterate a few things on the repentance from dead works, the faith towards God, and we're going to jump right into uh, the other stuff. So, with that being said, the questions on page 32, read the first question aloud, and then we're going to uh, ask another student to answer the question, and then we'll dig into it. So, someone read the question, and then we're going to get right into it. So, number one, why is it important for believing in particular to Jesus? Okay, here's the thing. When it says, why is it important for the believer to continually look towards Jesus? What stone is that? We got six stones. So Faith where? We got a Bible dictionary. Yes, I do. That should be your second stone. It's in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. One and two, you got repentance from dead works, and then the second stone is faith towards God. The question number one is saying, why is it important to keep looking unto Jesus, correct? Because we have to have our faith in something and someone, why not have it in Christ? You don't know the answer. You don't know all the answers. True. We, we don't have all of the answers, but we serve a risen Savior that holds the entire universe in the palm of his hands. He knows everything about us because he made us. He knows everything about this world because he created it. So there's nothing in this world that he doesn't already know about. Why not have faith in him? I mean, we put our faith in other things. We put our faith in the cars that we drive. You know, we don't go out there saying, Lord, I hope this thing start. We put the key in it, turn the key, and we expect it to perform. When it doesn't, we're like, oh, Lord, what's wrong with this car? Because we don't know until we start to troubleshoot. But the initial phase is to get in the car, stick the key in the ignition, and turn it on. We don't say, I pray this car start when I go out and get into it. Why? Because we already are, are just putting our faith that this thing is going to start. Why? Because A is new, B ain't nothing wrong with it, C I had a service. So we've done the practical. And it's the same thing 
in the Christian walk. We have to do the practical in order for God to do the providential. Okay, so let's, let's go on to question number two. I'm going to read out loud. The primary message preached by John the Baptist was what? What did he say to them folks when they came? Repent. Repent. Okay, he told them what to do. Repent. So there's the what. Why? Why did he repent? But why do I need to repent? He said, repent. Then he said, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The what was repent. The why was, man, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You don't want to miss this. Pretty much what John was saying. You don't want to miss this. You, you want to get this. And in order for you to get this, you need to repent. This is what John was telling him. Repent. And he was looking at John, why I got to repent? And he came back with the second clause. Well, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Everybody study about the Messiah. Everybody study God. Everybody understood about heaven. Everybody understood all of this. But when they're hearing John crying out in the wilderness with a leather girdle on, eating wild locusts and honey, looking like a wild man, they're like, you look at somebody today just standing out in the middle of the streets with, a, with leather underwear on and, and eating, eating locusts and honey, telling you to repent. First thing you're going to say, man, go take a bath or something. I mean, why are you going to clothes on? And this was, you got to look at it. This, is, this was John back then. They wore clothes back then. But this is John back then, a leather girl. Yelling, repent. The king of heaven that hand. And his delicatessen was wild locusts and honey. That was his diet. Wild locusts. Not just locusts, they were wild. You just couldn't catch these things. And honey. Go to the next question. Why do you think the message was received? And I, you know, I, I use this analogy in because I love football and I, I, I coach it, so I love coaching it. But I always tell people it's a lot easier coaching folks that don't know nothing about football than it is these rascals that have this television all in their mind and then they've been taught some other stuff somewhere else. And then now they have to unlearn this stuff, go back to the basics because they missed the basics. You know, they're trying to do all of this fancy stuff, but you don't even know the fundamentals. So it was easier for the commoners to grab this because they had never been introduced to Christ than it was for well, these people that have been studying about the Messiah for so many years because they think they had it all together. Don't like my light in the day. Don't, don't say nothing. But folks think they got it together. They arrived. And so they're, they're looking at the mindset was, what can you teach me? You out here telling me repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The law of Moses said all I got to do is keep the commandments. These, these, these folks used the law of Moses on Jesus. But they didn't understand. Jesus was like, man, I was before Moses. That really just messed them up. They were like, wait a minute, I ain't really talking about you before Moses. Moses was X amount of years, and you, you're just 30. Moses is dead. How are you before Moses? It blew their minds. And so it's really hard for some people to grab the basics. And they choose to just stay in that realm of ignorance. Because I'm telling you, you got self-imposed ignorance, where folks just refuse, which we like to call it stupidity, because you know what's right, but you just still refuse to do what's right. That's stupid. And those who just don't know and they're just ignorant. So they're unconscious to their ignorance, and then you have those that are ignorant and self-imposed. They know what's right. 
but they don't want to go back to the beginning. No matter what you do, no matter what sport you play, you will always incorporate the fundamentals. That's why they have spring training. They go out there, what do they do? They start doing the basics. Jumping jacks, stretching, the basic drills. We don't even do that in this. This is the basics. And even though we do the physical, but this is the basics. God is saying, get back to the basics. And we don't want to get to the basics. And so it was so simple for the commoners. Because when, once Christ was introduced, once the kingdom was introduced to them, they were like, man, you, you got people saying, what must I do to be saved? That's what you have. And you have these people, you have these people that uh, are asking this question, and no one can give them an answer. Because they don't have the basics. What must I do to be saved? What you going to tell them? What would you tell? What? Someone come to you and say, what must I do to be saved? Have faith, see God, repent. That's what you're going to tell them. <laughs> I'm going to ask you. I need to know. So First, someone run up on you and say. I have to say, learn and understand God. I, I have to learn at this part to where, uh, you know how in school you'll memorize something and have to test. Uh -huh. But then you won't will truly understand it. So the Jewish leaders, they kind of memorized and, and, and taught something. Whereas they, uh, the Jewish common people, they understood it. Okay. I'm fresh off the streets. I see you go to church every Sunday. I see you go to church during the midweek. I see you go to church if they just turn the lights on. You bust the door down. My question now is, I know I need, I'm missing something in my life. I need something. What must I do to be saved? I'm coming to you. What must I do? First, establish a relationship with God. Establish a relationship with God. Now, I came to you, you said believe, repent, and what else? I think was something here. Uh, get to know God. Get to know God, God, repent, and believe. All right? I still, I'm still not there because I want to be saved. You still ain't told me how to be saved. See, the average Christian can't tell nobody, what must I do to be saved? Listen, what must I do to be saved? I ain't asking you what must I do to have a relationship. What must I do to be saved? We gotta, you had a word, if we believe. Go ahead and turn to Romans real quick. There's only one verse of scripture that you need to tell somebody in order for them to be saved. Some folks like to refer to it as the Romans road and all that other good stuff. 10 and 9. Thou shalt confess with thy mouth. See, this is the only people like to call Christianity a religion, but it's not a religion. It's a relationship. But they say that's the only religion where you got to confess something. Romans 10 and 9. They say that's the only one where you got to confess. There's no other religion out there where you have to confess anything. That kind of got confession and all this other good stuff. They wouldn't even know. Give me five, five, six, and all that other good stuff. But the veil was rent when he died. There was no, you didn't need anybody else going to speak on your behalf to the Lord. So Romans 10 9 say that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, confess what? The Lord Jesus. You just can't be like confession. You got to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And once you do that, it says, and you have to believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. Then you say, you mean to tell me all I have to do is just believe in my heart? 
and then confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus? If I just confess the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead on the third day, that's it? That's it. I'll never forget in New York, myself and a precious brother, uh, he was an elder in the church, his name was uh, Brother Tober. I just called him Brother Tober. Well, that was his name, Tober, Brother Tober. And we led a young man to the Lord. And he looked at us and said, that's it? And I said, yeah, that's it. And so I'm, I'm crazy. So I said, what do you want me to do? Flip the light? I mean, tell me what you want me to do. Because he was looking for, I mean, he was literally looking for the building to shake, to rattle, or something. And he immediately got upset. He was angry and told it myself, and I, and I told Tobit, let's, let's wait, because he's going to say something. And he said, all these years, all these years, he was Catholic, he said, all these years, they've been lying to me. This is his, I'm telling you, this is exactly what he said. All these years, I've been raised Catholic, all, like, all these years, they've been lying to me. And he said, you mean to tell me that's it? I said, brother, that's it. You saved. You're not going to hell. You're going to heaven. But I said, you have to work it out now. You got to walk this thing out now. I said, you think the enemy was after you before. It's on now. But this brother was looking for the building to shape, lights to come. I mean, I said, man, I'll, I'll hit the lights for you if that's what you want. But I said, it's not in the lights. It's not in the shaking. It's not in the shout. All we have to do is just confess the Lord Jesus and then believe God raised him from the dead. And that's it. That is it. So I said, what I got to be saved? Confess the Lord Jesus and then believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And they're going to look at you and say, that's it. That's it. There's nothing else. If we try to add anything else to that, we just messed it up. We just we just messed up the plan of salvation. Go ahead and read the uh, next one. That would make a great time. Define biblical brokenness. Biblical brokenness. What you got? You sis. Uh, uh, convicted by the Holy Spirit. Convicted. Yeah, convicted by the Holy Spirit, which enables, which enables our will to become one with God's will. It enables our will to become one with God's will. Yeah. Biblical brokenness. What's your book say? Tell me what the book said. I'm listening. <laughs> brokenness Biblical brokenness uh, Brokenness is our willingness To do God's will It's a willingness You don't, you don't longer want to do your will Because it's no it's, You know whenever you want to do your will What you're saying is it's all about me when you no longer want to do your will, what you're saying now is it's all about Him. It's all about Christ. And then when we do that, when we do that, then we understand that it's, it's not about us. There's nothing in us that's any good. There's nothing about us that's any good. Everything that we are and everything that we have is because of Him. Page 44. That's what we want to pick up at in the heart book. Biblical repentance. It's all about who? It's all about Christ. It's all about Christ. When you point people to Christ, you take the emphasis off of you. You take the eyes off of you. That's why it's so easy to stand before people. Because it's not about me. 
all the flaws, all the dents, all the cracks. I don't know. I don't have to worry about that because I'm just pointing you to Him. But when someone wants to focus their attention on themselves, then it's all about them. And then God said, no man will ever steal my glory. And he'll deal with it. Next question. Read, read the next question out of the workbook. Memorize Isaiah 1, verse 8 and write it in memory. Anybody memorize it? Now you could memorize 6, 1, and 2, but you can memorize Isaiah. I don't remember that. Did you remember 6, 1, and 2? Hebrew 6, 1, and 2? That was, we're supposed to memorize that. What we got? What we got? Those are the stones. What was it? Hebrews. I don't have Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. She did. But the, 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 the foundational scripture for this class is Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, which is, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundations of, then it enumerated the six stones, which is the foundation. Repentance from dead work, faith towards God, doctrines of baptisms, the laying on of hands. Come on. Resurrection of the dead. Uh-huh. It's only six. So that's our foundation. That's what we build off of. And we understood that there is no building unless we have a foundation. We cannot build unless we have a foundation. Next question. Go ahead and read that out for me. That's, that's outstanding that you memorized it. That's good. The initial act of receiving the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Is one of the five I can't hear you. It's one of the five pivotal stones. There's five or six? Or six. There's six stones. What is the question? The initial act of receiving the Lord is what? Surrender. Go ahead. What you got? It says surrender. Surrender. Okay. That's, that's a synonymous term. What you got? Something repent. Repenting. Repenting and surrender. We just said a key word in the last okay. question. Broken. Brokenness. You can't repent until you're broke. And I'm talking about financially broken. I mean, you have to be broken. Peter's heart was broken when the Lord told him, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Peter said, no, nope, not me. Never, ever will I ever deny you. He said, Peter, I'm telling you, before the cock crow three times, you're going to deny me. The cock crowed. Then Peter remembered what the Lord said. And he began to weep. He wasn't crying because, oh man, Jesus was right. He began to weep because his heart was broken and he had betrayed someone that loved him, cared for him, slept with him, ate with him, taught him, saved him from drowning. I mean, this is the same man. The Savior. And he's like, wait a minute. He told me I was going to do this. It's one thing for someone to say something. It's another thing for it to manifest. And you're like, oh my God. So I'm like, oh man, that, that person knew what they were talking about. No, that was the Holy Spirit speaking through them. That was the Holy Spirit talking to you. And the question now is, do you have enough sense to listen? Most folks just hard-headed. You know, the old folks say a hard head make a soft behind. And, and we don't understand that. 
So we want to go through the school of hard knocks. This is why we have this book, to teach us. So, read the next question, because we want to get to the question before we start tackling this stuff, because I'm going to run real fast once we get into uh, page 44. Jesus went to the garden of uh, Gethsemane. You got Gethsemane? Gethsemane. And, uh, oh, the word Gethsemane in Greek means oil press. Okay. Gethsemane. A lot, of, a lot of theologians like to say this was the, the place of pressing. It was, it was a very, it was a very, just, it was a stern place. It was for pressing, and, and it was like oil press, or uh, another synonymous term was wine press, but the, the pressing of the crushing uh, of, of grapes. And so when you look at all of that, it was a place to where it wasn't a very comfortable place. It's a place to where you got to get out of yourself. This wasn't the first time that Christ went to Gethsemane, but this was a place of prayer. It was a place of pressing. It was a place of getting rid of your will and receiving His. Christ knew what His, his assignment was. Don't ever get that wrong. He knew what His assignment was in reference to going to die. But it was just a, a thing of when you get to Gethsemane or re repentance, Metanea, when you get to Gethsemane, it's pressed. Metania means to change your mind. I have a question. So he went there because he he wanted to do his own will? Just pray. Or, okay. It wasn't about his will. He never, see, everybody would say, oh, he was having one of those moments. No, he wasn't. Every time he opened his mouth, my will is to do what? The will of him that's sick. There's a difference in being sick. One and a went one. Big difference. When you're sick, you have the authority. You have the permission to operate and do whatever. Y'all sick here, right? Y'all didn't just arrive here and say, I'm, I'm going to work here. You were sent, which means you have everything, all types of documentation that you need to come through the passage. When you are with one, you have to pay your own fare. We have a person that wants to do it their way, and we like to look at it as far as when it came to Nineveh and Jonah. Jonah had to pay his own fare. Had he just went and did what the Lord told him to do. It was a three days journey. And he got there in one day. One day. Because that was his assignment. And the Lord said, I will redeem the time. And so a lot of us, we try to get ahead of God. And don't want to wait on God. And then we want to do it our way. And we mess it all up. And then God still, he's sitting there waiting for you to get done. And when you're done, you're like, okay, now, are you ready now? Now let's do it my way. And this is where you get not thy will, you know, my will, but thy will. And so he's teaching us. Everything Christ did was a teaching point for us. This book is nothing but one big book of instructions for us. It shows up all the people's mishaps, mistakes. It shows us the blessings and the curses. It shows us in obedience we'll be blessed. It shows us if we're not obedient, there's wages. There's blessings, there's curses, and the wages of sin is death. Read the next question. Uh, explain the reason why Jesus went to why God the Father forsook His Son Jesus. Oh man, y'all remember that one? Y'all got that? Y'all got the answer? Uh, Why did He forsake Jesus? So that He would never forsake us. There you yeah. have it. He forsook Jesus so that He would never forsake us. No matter what we do, <clears throat> we're loved by God, and the door is open. All we have to do is receive. See, we can never say, my God.